Um, yeah, so hello, so welcome to our presentation on the mastoid process. Um, so hopefully most of you are going to be familiar with the content in this already and it should just be a bit of revision, which is useful because the exam's coming up. Um, so what we're going to talk about, um, so this is just a brief summary, we're going to talk a bit about the anatomical location of the mastoid process, a few of the bony landmarks, we're gonna, Matt's going to mention a bit about the facial nerve, we're going to talk about the muscle attachments, the use of this in clinic and mastoiditis, which has already been mentioned today. So looking at the temporal bone, probably something we're all familiar with. Um, so like I said, what we're going to focus on is the mastoid, which is number two located on this diagram. Thank you. Okay, so the petrum mastoid bone contains both the middle and inner ears. The superior surface itself forms the floor of the middle and posterior cranial fossa, which is something that we looked at in week one when we were looking at the skull. Um, so the posterior cranial fossa itself, like it says on the slide, is um, pierced by the internal acoustic medius, which allows passage of the face, facial and vest, vestibulocochlear cranial nerves, which obviously, guessing from the anatomical location, this makes sense. So the inferior surface then contains the carotid canal for the internal carotid artery, and the mastoid process is the location of your mastoid air cells. So the mastoid process, just looking at it individually, said earlier, it's a projection of the temporal bone, and there's a deep groove present on its medial side, this is the occipital groove um, which supports the occipital artery which supplies, which is the blood supply basically for your back of your scalp down to about your neck. Um, the mastoid nut allows <coughs> present between the two, sorry, um, allows the attachment for the, the digastric muscle. So um, obviously, just as some kind of guess, because males are a bit larger than girls, um, their mastoid process is a bit larger and it's located at the level of C1, which is the outlet. So, um, so now for a bit of audience participation, um, if you'll just kind of want to palpate for where you think your mastoid is, it's kind of a bit of practice. Yeah, um, so it just kind of feels round and superficial. It's something that's quite easy to palpate in your posterior area. Okay, so um, muscle attachment. So Matt's my willing volunteer for this. Um, so what's attached to the mastoid process? So firstly, we've got your splenus capatitis, which is the prime mover for head extensions. And then we've got the longimus capacitus, which is responsible for flexing the head and extending the vertebral column. Next, we've got the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and this aids in jaw opening, um, and it also elevates the hyoid bone and larynx um, during swallowing, um, along with other suprahyoid muscles. Next is, and last, is the stenocloidomastoid muscle, which is responsible for rotating the head and flexing the neck. Okay. And if you can just kind of like look on the diagram, you can see where they're all located around the neck. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Matt to talk to you a bit about more clinical things. So now we're going to take a bit of a look at the more clinical side of the mastoid process. We're going to start off by looking at its relation to the facial nerve, as stated in some of the previous presentations. The facial nerve runs posteriorly to the mastoid antrum through the internal acoustic meatus. If infection occurs in the mastoid air cells, this can cause compression of the facial nerve, which will, result, which will result in facial nerve palsy or Bell's palsy, which causes weakness in the muscles which are supplied by the nerve at that side. In utero, the mastoid process is a lot smaller than it is in adults, which means that it's unable to provide protection to the facial nerve. As a result, if you do forcep delivery and it applies compression to the mastoid process, it can, it can cause compression to the facial nerve itself. Generally, this will own, this will, the palsy will happen for three to four days and full function should return in three to four weeks. But in 16% of cases, muscle weakness can occur for nigh on four years at 42 months, which means that it's going to take a longer while for it, for it to heal. The main use of the mastoid process in the clinical place is, to, is the use of the RINS test. This is a test of cranial nerve 8, the vestibulococcular nerve, also known as the auditory nerve you'd need to use a low frequency tuning fork and it should be struck and placed on the mastoid process behind the auditory canal and then once the patient can no longer hear it they should signal and you should move it so the tuning forks are in front of the auditory canal itself. In normal hearing loss the conduction through air is greater than the conduction through bone so after they said they can no longer hear it on the mastoid antrum they should then return to be able to hear it when it's moved in front of the auditory canal. You can have abnormal hearing of both uh, conductive and sensory neural. Conductive 
is where there is an inhibition of passage or an occlusion that stops the sound waves passing through to the tympanic membrane. But you can also have sensory neuronal hearing loss where both bone and air conductions diminish equally. Uh, so it's got the same pattern as normal hearing, but they always say that the sound has been cut out before it has. Moving on to mastoiditis now. This is an inflammation of the mastoid air cells, which can often result in otitis media. Mastoid air cells themselves are just a section on the medial side of the mastoid process with a hum honeycomb-like structure. It's a bony mesh with lots of air inside. But at birth, it's not usually pneumatized. So over the first year of life, it's aerated. If this doesn't occur, then it can be a sign of eustachian tube dysfunction. The normal causes of mastoiditis are an untreated middle ear infection generally caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. It can also be caused by cholestioma, which is an abnormal collection of skin cells which can lead to improper drainage due to either occlusion or it can digest some of the surrounding airway. No, airway. Mastoiditis is more common in children. As with all inflammatory diseases, it comes with the four cardinal signs of inflammation, including rubor, calor, tumor, and dolor. These all happen in the postauricular area where the mastoid process itself is located. It can often lead to auricular discharge, hearing loss, hearing loss in the affected ear, and a headache. To diagnose this, you would use otoscopy. You can also use an ear culture from the discharge that's released from the ear. You can use blood test, and it is possible to use a CT scan to detect whether it's present or not. The general treatments for mastoiditis are to use antibiotics, either florally or intravenously, depending on how severe the case is. If these do not work, then surgery can be done. You can drain the middle ear using a myringotomy, or you can remove part or all of the mastoid bone by doing a mastoidectomy. The consequences of untreated can lead to blood clots. If the infection tracks up into the meninges, it's called, it can cause meningitis. And finally, it can also cause a brain abscess if left untreated. Any questions? Well, there are some very interesting points brought out by the presenters uh, in relation to this pro uh, um, uh, part of the, uh, the temporal bone. 
So the point made by the presenter is that the mastery process is another email than in email. Yeah. Did people think that's true? And if it is, what's the explanation for it? I'll give you a clue of why the mastery process uh, varies in size. Yes. Also, the explanation why in babies um, the master process is, is virtually underdeveloped, in, a, in addition to the pneumatization, of course. But in terms of its, its, its size, it's quite small as a result because there's really not much usage of muscles at that stage. And so that's why the uh, facial nerve tends to be at risk of damage. So that's, that's, um, that's important, I think. Now, there's also another um, point made by the presenters that this. Um, before pneumatization of muscle process in babies, there's, a re there's an increased risk of uh, um, uh, eustachian tube dysfunction. Did you get that? Did anybody pick up that bit of information? Did you say that, Jordi? Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you understand what this, what this means about the importance of muscle process then? Do people understand its, its no, clinical importance or anatomical importance? Or could somebody guess why the master process is probably very important in the in the design of the middle ear? Could somebody explain why in babies there's a, an increased risk of uh, eustachian tube dysfunction? Putting aside, not notwithstanding the angle of the drainage of the tube itself, why is the why is master process in, um, or its its uh, pneumatization important? It equalizes the pressure, yeah. In terms of equalization pressure, you probably would be looking at comfort or discomfort of the, um, <coughs> the tympanic membrane. So equalization pre of pressure is good in terms of you end up with bleeding or pressure so that it's not painful. But there's something more to it than that. So that's, that's a good start. So could people sort of understand or explain the importance of mustard air cells in middle ear normal function? It's a theoretical concept. Mm -hmm. clean, how about clean it? What's so long? Keep you doing that. Sorry. <laughs> um, in children, uh, there's a higher risk of eustachian tube dysfunction. Uh, irrespective, you, put, you know, with notwithstanding the angle of drainage of the um, uh, of, of the actual angle of the eustachian tube itself. But there's always a risk of middle, uh, middle ear dysfunction in children as a result of lack of pneumatization of the mastoid air cells. No. Not a question. So, are you why are they more prone to. That's right, yeah. To in, other, in other words, what's the normal function of the mastoid air cells in the middle ear function? Pressure. Well, that's what we said about mm -hmm. uh, about bleeding of pressure, which is quite good. But also, it's the reservoir of fresh or oxygenated air that actually is where most of the oxygen to the middle ear tends to actually be stored. So, as a result, it's largely this equalization of pressure. It's also renewing of oxygenated air that actually is stored in the mastoid air cells. So, if you lose that, then the middle ear, you know, soon runs out of oxygenated air. And as a result, you end up with anaerobic respiration, which then gives you middle ear dysfunction. So without the mastoid air cells, the middle ear is really doesn't work as well. So then you can imagine then in situations where mastoiditis develops and the, the mastoid air cells have to be removed, what the consequences of that are. So you end up with largely uh, recurring chronic infections of the ear. Yeah? So that's really why I wanted that. That presentation on the on the uh, mastoid cells. Uh,